Well, let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you for church. I thank you that we uh, come to a place that awakens our hearts and um, reminds us of who we long to be. Um, this is an aspirational place, Lord. Uh, I know a lot of things that I prayed this morning, a lot of things that I sang this morning, I wish were true of me. Uh, and I want them to be true. And I thank you that you stir our hearts to deeper things. And so as we sit in this tender spot of, of dreams and hopes and faith, um, as we open up your word, may it further embolden our hearts. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. My Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. So it was July 29th, 2010, the Baltimore Orioles had, were mired in years and years of losing seasons, and they hired a new manager by the name of Buck Showalter. And Buck Showalter was a two, previously two-time manager of the year, and so there was a level of excitement having this new manager come in, and what was he going to think, and how was he going to change the culture of the team, and many people just expected that he would come in and clean house, and and as he began to lead and manage the team and, and people began to ask him who he, how he planned to kind of change this whole thing around, at one point someone asked him about a lot of the players on his team. And he, and he, and he muttered these words. He's kind of got like a Texas drawl to him. But when he was commenting on the, on the players of the Orioles, these, these guys that had been losing season after season after season, he kind of turned to the press and he said, I like our guys. He kind of said it like this, I like our guys. That's kind of how Buck Shawwalter talks. But he said, I like our guys. And those words, in, in many ways, kind of emboldened and sort of began to change the culture of the Orioles. And it, didn't, it doesn't work anymore. I know that. It's 2018. But from 2012 to about 2016, those, those comments, those words that these guys that you want to overlook, these guys that you don't think are any good, I like these guys and I see something in these guys. And there's something about great leaders, great managers who have the capacity to see what other people don't in others. And I think God does the same thing. God often looks and sees what others don't. And God has a way of looking and seeing somebody that you might overlook and you might tend to undervalue and say, I like that guy. I like that woman. I like that person. That's one of my people right there. That certainly is true for the passage that we have this morning before us. It's a kind of a famous story of the Ethiopian eunuch. It's in Acts chapter 8, and it's coming sort of um, post-persecution of the church, and the church is beginning to scatter, and one of the peoples that scattered was this, this guy named Philip, who was one of the leading deacons of the early church. And Philip had just gone to Samaria and spread the word, and, and, and many people were coming to faith. And Philip finds himself uh, on, a, on a road, and he encounters an Ethiopian eunuch. And I want to read it, and I want us to think about it. So Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40 should be up on the screen. It says this, Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south of the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. Candace, by the way, is not, it's just a name for queen in Ethiopian. It's not a specific person. In charge of her entire treasury, he had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. It's an interesting little side note, and so he was reading it out loud. You'll see this in a second, but I, I didn't even think about this. But back then, books uh, were, were not frequent. They weren't around a lot, and... Um, people read aloud a lot. And what would basically happen is you would, you would hire somebody uh, to read, and they would read, and a bunch of people would listen because he couldn't check his iPhone. He wasn't on Netflix as he was traveling, right? And, and he didn't even have many books. So the, the idea that he was reading aloud would be kind of culturally, that's how they did things back then. 
Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go over to his chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, Do you understand what you are reading? He replied, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep he was led to slaughter, like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, About whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then the prophet began to speak, and starting with the scriptures, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, as, as, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns he came to by Caesarea. So, so th- there's basically three things that I want to talk about that I think... Um, Jesus, that God points out about this Ethiopian eunuch, three things that he likes about him that we might overlook, and and these three are this. He is different, he's willing to change, and he stayed spiritually hungry. So let's take a look at those three things. The very first thing that I think is interesting and worth kind of just pointing out and pondering for a little bit is that, that one of the key factors of this Ethiopian eunuch is how different he is from Philip. This is, this is by all accounts, right, a divine encounter. When you read all of the details of this story, you, I, I can rest assured I've been in ministry over 25 years now, and something like this has never happened to me, right? I've never been picked up, transplanted, sent next to someone, running alongside them saying, hey, what are you reading, the Bible? You know, like, like, oh yeah, can you help me out? Like, it doesn't tend to work like that, right? I think a lot of us read that, we're like, why doesn't this happen to me? Well, one of the things you have to stop and realize is this is a divinely orchestrated encounter because God wants us to see something about his heart this is about the heart of God and God orchestrates all this in a uniquely divine way I think to relay God's heart and what he wants you to see is that that he's going to bring together two incredibly different people you've got a white kind of middle class Jewish guy encountering an African black sexually altered person And these two people are somehow going to come together in a unique way. In fact, the the text even goes out of its way to say it's on a mountain road, a road that like most people aren't even traveling on. And somehow God brings them together. And I think what God, what what the heart of God is sort of screaming is to all of us in this is that 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 God is in the business of tearing down barriers. It grieves the heart of God when we ignore people of different cultures. God is a barrier-breaking God. The, The Christian faith does not belong to one culture over another. You know, it's interesting, um, that of all the religions in the world, this is an interesting fact, of all the, most of the religions of the world, their epicenter is still basically where they were founded. In other words, if you look at Islam, most of the Muslims in the world are sort of surrounding where Islam started. If you look at Hinduism, most of the Hindus in the world are where it started. If you look at Buddhism, most of it, you know, it does, they do spread, but primarily they're still centered on the main culture in which they started. Christianity is... Is, is much more culturally diverse. diverse. A lot of people like to criticize Christianity, like, oh, it's just a, it's just a subset of Western European society, that, but that's not true at all. In fact, right now, 22% of all Christians are from Africa, 25% are from South, South or Central America, and 19% are from Asia. 
God is in the business and always has been in the business of breaking down cultural barriers. And that's exactly what I think he's trying to show in this encounter with the, with the Ethiopian eunuch, that God wants to break down barriers. I like this quote from Tim Cowher. He said, God is trying to show them and us that it is the job of the Holy Spirit to recreate the Christianity in the soil of every culture. One of the most foundational questions you need to ask yourself and we need to ask ourselves, is what are you going to do with the other? What are you going to do with the person that is different than you? What are you going to do with the people that, for whatever reason, culturally, age-wise, um, appearance-wise, you know, kind of things they're into-wise, are different than you? If we cannot, as the body of Christ, learn to embrace the other, we're not following the heart of God. Now, this certainly has big, huge ramifications. I know I look around this room and, you know, you can say, oh, we're, we're, we're pretty culturally similar in this room. And I would say, really? Have you gotten to know someone of a different age range than you? Have you intermingled with someone in a different season of life or a different marital state or whatever it is? There is always the other. And we tend to classify people for not careful by all of these things. And God tends to strip them away because God wants to get at the heart. And, to, and even though culture matters and culture is important, and I, and I know that, you know, all that, I'm not saying it's wrong to be with people that are similar to you, but the other is everywhere. And are you looking for it? We are going to grow as a church when we learn how to embrace the other. If our goal is just to be us, we lose. But if we reach out to the other, if we have a heart for reaching the other, we begin to grow. In fact, most churches grow when there's all sorts of different groups. So I, I laid this challenge on you um, the, end, the end of last year, and I continue to challenge you with this. I, I would love for by the end of this year, you know one person only because you met them here. Not because they run in your social circles, not because they're in a similar life phase, but you met somebody and someone says, how do you know that person? Oh, from my church. My church. This place where we have learned to embrace each other. The other. The other is everywhere and God longs for us to know that. And so one of the first things that I think God is saying about, I like this guy, I like this Ethiopian eunuch. He's so different than you, Philip. Look at all the ways that he's different, but look at his heart. Can you embrace him? I like this guy, Philip, God says. And that says a lot to us. But the second thing that I find very interesting about this Ethiopian eunuch is that he was willing to change. Philip comes up beside him. He's, he's reading the, prophet, the, the book of Isaiah out loud. He probably, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, he probably went to the temple and then he bought, probably bought, bought a scroll because he was obviously a man of means and he was driving home and he was reading it out loud. And he's, and he's reading it and, and, and Philip asks him a great question. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And I love his response because I'm not sure I would have acted like, like he did. I don't know about you, um, I, I am a classic male, like those of you that are young don't have this problem because you all have your phones, right, you know, that tell you where to go, but like I never wanted to ask for directions. I always, you know, if, if you sort of asked me like, you know, if I knew where I was going, even if I didn't, I'd be like, yeah, I got it, I'm good, we're good. You know, and, and so often when someone asks, you know, he, here, here's this eunuch reading this scroll, learning these things about God, and, and, and he's like, Philip says, do you understand? He's like, no, I don't actually. I don't really understand what, I, what I'm reading. One of the things that I have found so interesting about people and their relationship with God is that they, we all act like we know a lot more than we do, don't we? 
When, when someone questions you or challenges what you believe about God or when you come across something about God that you don't understand, you know, we tend to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. I got it. I'm good. I don't, you know, don't, don't, I, don't, I don't need to get too much into it. But this guy says, no, like, how, like I, I don't understand this. And, and he even goes, like, how can I understand it if nobody explains it to me? This guy was, he was willing to change. He was open to learning. I think God looks at people and he looks at hearts and he looks for open hearts and he says, I like that one. Look at that heart. I like that heart. That's a heart that's willing to grow. That's a heart that is open. And so Philip begins to share, you know, and, and it's really interesting, like what he shares, the, the very thing about God that I don't think we could ever intuit is the very thing Philip has to share. In other words, if, if, I were, if we were to go out today and we were to leave here and we were to just go out randomly and say, I want you to go around Towson and I want you to ask people, like, what do you, what do you think God is like? And, and all across the spectrum, people would probably say, well, God, you know, he probably created everything. Uh, I think he's nice, you know, um, loving. He's probably like morally better than I am. I think he, you know, I think he's probably good. Um, he's powerful. All those kind of things we could sort of all just intuit about God. And I think there's good reasons we can. I think God is constantly revealing those things. But the part that we could never get is the sacrificial love of God. We don't intuit our way to the cross. The cross has to be proclaimed. The cross has to be announced. The cross has to be explained. It has to be explained to you how a holy, loving, creator God can connect to a sinful, broken person without contaminating himself. And the only way that he could do that is when he suffered on our behalf. We don't intuit, we don't think our way to that. That has to be told to us. It must be announced. It must be explained. And this guy, he's at this place where what he knows about God and what he knows about himself isn't lining up. And so his heart is open and Philip can explain it to him. The substitutionary sacrifice of God is something that must be announced. And then I love this. He says, look, there's some water. Let me be baptized. And we don't need to get into all the details, but here's what I'd say. When he says, let me be baptized, he's saying, I am willing to change. Because the baptism was a sign of conversion. It was a sign of saying, I want to change. He allowed the substitutionary, sacrificial heart of God to change him. It changed him. Is it changing you? Is it, is it molding your heart? Is it grabbing your heart in such a way that you're like, I want to be different I don't want to be this way anymore. I want what you're talking about. I want something more out of my life. Are you allowing, are you letting in the substitutionary, sacrificial love of God in such a way that it's starting to change you? I think God looked at that heart and he said, that's a heart I like. I like that heart. I want that heart. So not only is the Ethiopian eunuch different, but he's willing to change and I think the last reason that God looked at this guy and said, I like this guy, is that he stayed with his spiritual hunger. I was talking to somebody just this week who's made some bad decisions and struggling with a lot of things. And we sat down to catch up, and he was sort of catching me up on some of his mistakes, and I appreciated his honesty, and I, I think he was sort of looking to me to... Um, you know, give him some good practical advice, help him through the situation. And I just kept struggling with what to say. And so I said to him, like, you know, I don't, I don't know that I've got any great, like, practical advice for you. But the one thing that keeps kind of ringing in my heart is that 
stay with your hunger. Because obviously these mistakes that you have made are rooted in a hunger you have. And I think only God can satisfy that hunger. And it was interesting how the conversation just sort of changed at that moment. I think the eunuch, let's think about the eunuch for a second. Let's take a look again at who this guy was. He was obviously, it says, he was a high-ranking government official. Um, You know, it says that he was a eunuch, which means uh, he had to be castrated. Um, I would bet that one of the reasons that um, he was able to be a high-ranking eunuch was a government official is he's willing to be castrated because a castrated person has no family to look out for. Um, he has no divided interest. So in, some, in, in many ways, he could be trusted in his high-ranking role. But look what he had to give up to get it. He had to, had to give up an awful lot to get to this place. And he probably paid a price for his success. And I'm guessing that that brought to him some kind of emptiness. And the only reason I can guess that is he's Ethiopian, right? I mean, there was a G- Jewish community we know of near Ethiopia at that time, but this guy wouldn't have been born into the Jewish faith, but he probably, like, you know, is looking for God. He's looking for God enough that he, that he hooks up with the, probably the Jewish community near Ethiopia. They tell him to go to Jerusalem. Why don't you, you go to Jerusalem? Now, Ethiopia and Jerusalem are pretty far away from each other. And, and to be a high-ranking government official, this wasn't like he could get on Southwest, book a flight, be back by the next weekend. You know, this was like, you know, you're going to be gone for a while. You're probably threatening your role. There's a lot going on. But this guy was willing to roll the dice. He travels all the way to Jerusalem and he goes to the temple. And here's the thing. Here's an interesting thing that probably happened to him at the temple. And this is a, another sermon for another day. But at this time, the temple would have been operating under Mosaic law. And one of the things that would have been true in Mosaic law is that no castrated people were allowed deeper into the temple. No sexually mutilated people could enter into the core area of the temple. And so here's this guy, this hungry guy that traveled all of this way, probably looking for God. And I'm guessing at some level he gets to the temple and he can't get in. And he, and he buy, and, and I don't know, it doesn't tell us, but I've got to think that's got to be a pretty defeating thing. And he, and he buys a scroll, and this is interesting, he buys a scroll from the prophet Isaiah. Now Isaiah would have written, an Old Testament prophet, would have written 700 years before this. And he happens to be in Isaiah in the 50s, right? He's in Isaiah 53 when Philip encounters him. But you know, it, it's interesting, why, was, why would he be in Isaiah well, I, I got a sense he was probably searching around for a verse that he'd heard of because in Isaiah 56, Isaiah says this. He says, don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say the Lord will never let me be part of his people. And don't let the eunuch say I am a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says. I will bless those eunuchs. I will bless them. I will give them within the walls of my house a memorial and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I give them is an everlasting one. I will never disappear. I got to wonder when he was like, okay, what scroll could I buy? I know I've heard something in the prophet Isaiah that he writes about eunuchs. I'd love to find it somewhere. And he's probably poking around looking for it. And he's in Isaiah 53 and he's getting close. And he's reading, when he's in Isaiah 53, he's reading about this suffering servant. And Philip shows up. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? Do you get it? Do you see it? 
And he begins to explain. He says, well, who is this servant? Is it, is, is it the prophet? Is, that, is it Isaiah talking about himself? Or is he talking about someone else? And, and Philip says, no, 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 he's talking about Jesus. And he begins to explain to him the good news of Jesus. And he, and he begins to help this guy see that, that Jesus suffered for him. That Jesus died and, and, and became, you know, became a eunuch for him. He, Jesus was cut off so that he could be grafted in. And all of a sudden his hunger begins to awaken and there might be an answer. He's like me. Jesus is like me. Jesus is for me. He probably only got to this place because he stayed with his hunger. On Easter, Whitney and Jamie uh, did a great job of sharing their testimonies. They shared the struggles of, kind of, Whitney shared the struggles of changes in family and all the challenges of, of life. And Jamie shared the struggle of dealing with um, a cancer diagnosis. But, but at the core of both of what they were saying was that we are hungry Life tends to break us and rub us and mold us in such a way that I am not satisfied with life. I am hungry and I'm looking for more. And it's when you get to that point that someone says, do you understand what you're looking for? You're looking for Jesus. God sees that heart and he says, I like that heart. I like that heart. That's the kind of heart I'm after. Where's your hunger? Are you open? Do you realize that God has a plan and a desire to love all of us, regardless of our station in life and what little subgroup we fall into and where we fit in the grand scheme of our society? God wants us all. I want to do something um, I want to show you something. Um, in 1997, there was a movie put out called Amistad. And this film was based on a true story of a, of a, a slave ship in 1839 that was overthrown by the slaves on the ship. And um, the slave ship, it, it's taken over by the slaves, and then it is captured by the United States Navy and brought to a port in Boston. And all of a sudden, it creates a huge, this is a true story, a huge cultural conundrum because the United States at this point is coming to grips with slavery and trying to figure out where they stand. And so what they're going to do with these slaves is a powerful social question. Um, but, the, but the African slaves themselves are imprisoned as runaway slaves, and it leads to this dramatic court case, and that's what the movie's about. Um, but I wanted to show you this scene in the movie because I've been sort of talking abstractly about um, this Ethiopian eunuch. And you know how I started out being like, oh, that never happens. Well, this scene in the movie, I think, illustrates powerfully how God reaches hearts that are open regardless of the barriers or the challenges as long as they're hungry and they're seeking. The scene is going to be cued. The slaves are in prison, and one of the slaves um, has found a Bible, and he's leafing his way through the Bible, trying to figure it out based on the pictures that he sees. And so I want us to watch this for a few minutes. Morning, 
Se amou a pie. Tatoa é ha. Que. Boa ilo. Que nunca a yama. Ti é pe. Que ilo enga que ilo ego hum. Church one, I love that scene in the movie when he's flipping through the Bible and he's commenting on the suffering. And then he says, but then he came and everything changed. That was true for the Ethiopian eunuch and it's true for you. God wants to break down any barrier that might make you think going to keep you from him. God longs to explain to you and have you understand his substitutionary sacrificial love. And he wants to be the one that satisfies the hunger in your heart. May God bless you and fill you this week. Thanks for being here and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.